Ever-loving, everlasting God, we join to connect with you and each other, to lift up hearts and hopes that they might be light and well-prepared to respond to the call to do your will. And so we pray. Thank you, God, for a wonderful time spent with my new in-laws. Help our country come back together and move on to next chapters and rekindle the connections. My parents are still both laid off from work. Help them get called back to their jobs soon. Help my family get through the death of my grandmother. For my brother admitted to the hospital today with COVID. I'm dealing with panic. Please ask God to give me strength and hope to get through this and return to normal. For my dad, who was in a pretty bad accident, may his brain scans improve and he heal fast. For faculty, staff, and students impacted by COVID on our campuses. My cousin is dealing with cancer. Heal and support her and her family. For healing, forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation in a relationship, may God's love knit us back together. Please help me discern what God wants me to do to serve Him. Grant me a clear head and a clean conscience as I end a toxic relationship. May blessings abound in 2021, COVID cases declined, and harmony returned to the world. God of full promises and new beginnings, hear our prayers. Strengthen our resolve to be tangibly focused, stepping stones and next steps towards building your kingdom on earth and mindful of the goal of an eternity with you. Touch our hearts, strengthen our wills, and further shape our lives to serve in best use to the opportunities of your master plan. We ask this in your name. Amen. Greetings, welcome. It is time again to start up our chapel broadcast series. We're broadcasting again from the Martin Meditation Chapel here on the Ottawa University campus in Ottawa, Kansas. We're glad to be back with you. We had a little bit of break after New Year's. We just finished our prayers, and indeed there's much to pray for. I think things are a little less dark. Vaccine seems to be coming out. Politics is calming down some. So, indeed, the world we left last year and the one we're picking up this year is a little different. With all that said, so the question I got this time from a person, didn't know if it was a student or someone else, as there was not a name in the email thing, was, when, we're, when will our country get back to normal? All right. Admittedly, when I read that, I thought, I don't know. <laughs> Why would you ask me that? That's silly. I mean, if I knew that, I would probably be a very wealthy man because I would have all the answers. But as I really reflected on that, what I thought is that maybe that was a perfect question for some of my own ponders. I don't think normal will be the same. It won't. So when will our country find new normal? Well, one of the things as I struggled early on in wrestling with whether or not it made sense for me to fully commit to being a Christian had to do with a reconciliation between Old Testament and New. That law and prophets concept. The Old Testament very much being a God of control. And frankly, as, as I've shared with you in the past, some things that happened in the Old Testament that made me a bit uncomfortable. There was some smiting going on. There was people that were leaders that really ended up being sort of not cool, but still loved by God. All those things that I, I wrestled with juxtaposed with the whole concept of Jesus as, as turning the other cheek and, and laying down life for friend and praying for persecutors and all those things that made sense to me if the language of God was love. That's easy. Yet, Jesus specifically said that he did not come to abolish the law but to complete it. It's not a do-over then. It's not some issue where somehow all that passes away and what is replaced by all that control and smiting and imperfection is some perfect world of brotherly love. It's built on each other. 
we can't lose or leave behind the lessons. There, there's an old joke that they used to say, oh, what, did, what does Adam not have that we all have? And the answer on that was uh, ancestors. Well, maybe what humans really need is to see the lessons of the past so that we can go from childish to childlike. So today, in our chapel broadcast, we will reflect on that. We will first hear about the crave that we have as humans, like a deer that longs for running streams. One of my thing about going to Arizona many times is I'm really thirsty. Yeah, that dry heat, I know you always say that, but for a big boy like me from Kansas, I am in a continual state of thirst. I do long for water. And sometimes when I get it, and it's really cold from the convenience store, it is the best tasting water ever. And they say that supposedly when you really crave water and it tastes really good, you're starting to get dehydrated. I have felt that long more clean and more strong in these times of political turmoil and COVID than I ever have in my life. I don't know when I have so much craved that water spiritually. Then we'll hear what happens, the price of drinking it, the woes I always to think about it. And that's sort of a big thing that says, if you are privileged to have that water, then there's some things you cannot do. Because if you do that, where you may complete things for others and help them build those things together, you actually destroy things for yourself and potentially for others. You can make people twice as fit for hell as you are yourself. Whew, that's intense. But as we talked about two weeks ago, privilege in itself is a balance of your rights and your responsibilities. And as Christians, as we come together in this new year, in this time of rebuilding, it's time to put those together. Not only to lift them up into prayer, but to offer our hands for God's work to make the world the place that he intends for it to be. Thank you for being back with us. It's, it's good to be back with you. May we find fodder together, some soul food in this chapel, and enjoy the launch of a new year. Just like a deer that craves streams of water, my whole being craves you, God. My whole being thirsts for God, for the living God. When will I come and see God's face? My tears have been my food, both day and night, as people constantly question me, where is your God now? But I remember these things as I bear my soul, how I made my way to the mighty one's abode, to God's own house, with joyous shouts and thanksgiving songs, a huge crowd celebrating the festival. Why, I ask myself, are you so depressed? Why are you so upset inside? Hope in God, because I will again give him thanks my saving presence, and my God. Oh uh -huh.
and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter it to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much of a child as hell as yourself. Last year sometime, we talked about cost, value, and worth. How those things sort of blended. We, we live in a world right now that's really into sort of cost and value. How much does it cost? And if that's the case, does the value make sense? We try to find a deal. Man, I love a good deal. It's great to find stuff here in, in Ottawa at the thrift store. I love good thrift store stuff that fits or works. There is a great feeling about that. And in some ways, that deal makes things worth it, just because we got a deal. As is my nature, I'm going to tell horrible stories about my children, because I can. So my oldest son had a real issue with losing teeth. I mean, like, it really freaked him out. He would try to keep them in his mouth much longer than they should be. They really needed to come out. They were ready to. They were past the wiggle. He was terrified. He was freaked out of the fact that that was going to come out and would run from you when you were trying to assist and would try to keep the tooth in even though it was not attached to much, which may be a wee bit queasy, frankly. I didn't think it would, but yeah, that tooth needs to go. So even though as a family we were not visited by Santa Claus or Easter bunnies, we were visited by the tooth fairy. And in fact, I thought that would be a great thing. And back then, and this shows my age, well, when I was a kid, I think it was a dime. For Sean, it was a quarter. And then later, as bribery seemed to work better, because he got better with the tooth thing, it went up to 50 cents. Now, the strange thing about that is, once it went to 50 cents, he really did seem to lose some of his phobias on losing teeth. So Linda and I thought maybe that it was because it was something that was worth it then. But the weird thing is, in that time, he somehow turned into a tooth swallower. We didn't have to spend any money because the teeth would be gone. He would say, I lost my tooth. We would say, where is it? And he would say, I do not know. Okay, so that totally defeated the concept of the tooth fairy thing, but we were actually quite relieved because it was getting sort of traumatic, chasing a child around, either threatening pliers or dental floss, trying to get a tooth out. <clears throat> that year for Christmas, 
he had something special for us, and he was so excited. Now, the kids made us all sorts of things. My favorite, personally, were these egg cartons that had pine cones with glitter and some paint on it that were really cool Christmas ornaments. So we assumed that it would be something like that. He wanted us to open the, the, his particular present to Lynn and I last, so we did. And it's this huge box, and it's really light. Okay, no idea. Open it up, it appears to be empty. There's these little tissue paper, flowery kind of things in it. So we thought maybe it was an ornament. Very long and rather terrifying story short. What we realized when we went through the tissue paper is in each little clump of tissue paper was a tooth. He had wrapped the teeth that came out of his little head in tissue paper and gave them to us for Christmas. I would like to say that immediately I realized how sweet that was, but I have to tell you, it was really creepy. It was incredibly creepy. I just opened a box full of wrapped teeth. Oh, for the most part, I can take one or two of anything, but a whole scat of things, a whole scat of teeth. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> what he said, and this was him, is that calculating at the rate, he was able to give us about $30 worth of teeth. And what I realized then was that worth is a really relative thing. You know what? We never did know what to do with those teeth. I think they're still up in my wife's bureau drawer, her dresser drawer, in little pill bottles. All the kids' teeth. Why do we even do that? I don't know. You can't throw out your kids' teeth because there's some worth factor there. As humans, then, I think one of the hard things that we have is giving those awkward gifts to God and putting worth on them. God does not love us because we are worth it. We are worth it because God loves us. So we take whatever we can make. Sometimes those things that are a bit creepy, sometimes the things that scare us, that make us run screaming from the other room because we don't want it fixed. We work on it. Then we wrap it up and we let God. Yeah, the world's still pretty messed up. We have a lot of work to do to find the new normal, to get back to being brothers and sisters together. And that's really hard, because in so many ways, it's an issue that says, how do we balance what we know is part of Christ's message? We know that we're all body parts of Christ, all right? That is, I think, a good thing to think about. How do you get along with things? Again, we've said before, some are charming mouths and some are stinky armpits, whatever. But how do we work on our own body parts within our body parts? Where is that line where you say that if your eye offends you, you pluck it out and throw it on the fire? How does that balance then with that concept of of Christ's healing. Where's that line where we say that the reason that we have to pluck said eye out is because it's had a plank in it while we are so busy trying to tell other people how they could live their lives better so our world could be better, so we as body parts could get along better, which is an exertion of control, of Old Testament control. In a world <clears throat> like we have now, how do we come together and truly help each other? How do we find a way to say, it's an itch back here and I just can't reach it. And it's awkward for me to ask, but I'm going crazy. And I've rubbed against a tree and I've rubbed against a door jam and I'm now embarrassed, but please, as my brother and sister in Christ, help. I don't know. I do not know the answers with anything more than myself. And that's hard. For me, it is that issue of empathy and sympathy. <clears throat> Converting my circle of influence and circle of control into those things. Where does my heart go out to you as Jesus would have? And where do I just think you're freakish and I feel sorry for you? Now, if I feel that you're freakish and I feel sorry for you, do I tell you how to be less freakish or just avoid you? Neither of those are part of Christ's plan. I know that. 
where do we get past our own discomfort? Where do we come together as a country, as a people, as a Christian people? To tolerate each other because we are conjoined in Christ. That's pretty personal. That is an issue, the true test of cost, value, and worth. If the people that sit in the pew or I see at the grocery store or I see on campus cost a lot, if they get under my skin, if they drive me crazy, if they have banners or bumper stickers or T-shirts that offend, what's it really value to me? Why can't I just avoid them? Or if they drive me so crazy and I think that they're just too much into the concept of a flat earth, why don't I just correct them, give my wisdom and my proof, force my facts so they cannot deny what is true? Because as Christians, we are told that that is not worth it. We put our mind on God and his kingdom. And that means that those slower body parts and those with opinions and odors have to be treated specially, as scripture says. The problem is then, that doesn't normally deal with empathy or sympathy. It deals with lack of patience, in my case, or long-suffering, as Scripture would say. I just want things to be better. I want people to wake up. I want them to do their job. I want them to get along. I want them to play well. I want them to share the ball. And I want the world to be the verdant place God intended. That simple. Works in theory, but how do you coach yourself and others to get there? How do you make it so that you're not just a team of one or a team of those you sort of like? Well, here's what I'm working on for myself. <clears throat> when we started way back last year, we talked about that feel, felt, found concept. What do we feel? And if you think about feelings as sort of being Jesus, Jesus was sent a God part to help us get in touch with feelings. Feelings of cursing the fig tree, feelings of upending the temple, feelings of wanting cups to pass us by. Feelings, and you've probably heard this before, of being able to love the sinner but hate the sin. You heard about those woes. Could God, certainly a God of justice in Old Testament, just smite all the Pharisees? Of course he could. Jesus didn't even advocate that. He said to pay attention to what they said, but not the practices. I've told you a lot of stories about my kids. I love my dad. My dad was a great man, and he's now in heaven. But I learned a lot from things that my dad did in parenting that I vowed as a young me I would not do because of how they made me feel. That feeling on the inside. In feeling that, I didn't want to pass that on. So, in the concept of the Spirit coming down, feel felt, that's history. How can we learn from history? How can we not make the same mistakes of intolerance, of injustice, of judgment that our forebears have done? When do the sins of the Father finally become broken? Because we can learn from that and say, that never leads us down a path towards God. And with that, we finally find perspective, found. We talked then about that concept of power, control, and perspective. Found then is finding perspective in what has happened long before us, in what is happening now, and acknowledging where we contribute to it. So if we go back to the question that I got, I think that the real question then as far as when things turn back to normal is when we grow and evolve. Now, evolution in so many ways is also mutation. We can mutate good or we can mutate bad. But if we keep our mind on God, we will find that we morph and grow into the exact thing that he needs in the world today, each one of us. And as we come together then, we have the perfect body to serve Christ. We feel it. We felt it and remember. We found it. And that means that this time next year, 
the world will be a place we don't even recognize. Not because it's normal or even new normal, but because it's improved, because it's closer to the image of building his kingdom here so that we can appreciate his kingdom in heaven. What is your charge then? Well, we talked some about it. Your charge is to witness. Witness now. In all those forms we talked about, we open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to Jesus' instructions. As Roger said a couple of weeks ago, what would Jesus see through his eyes? As I said prior to that from that book, what would Jesus do? And with that perspective, we take everything in. We weigh it on its merits. Next, what would we do to fit into that? Sometimes that might mean we need to make it better in the realm of influence and concern. We need to tangibly roll up our sleeves and feed somebody or take care of someone with COVID. Or, and sometimes that means we really need to pray and let go and let go. Vaccin vaccinations are a little slow. Don't know what to do about that. I'll pray. God, I trust you to make this work. So we've seen it. We figured out where we fit. And the last thing is to role model Christ's behaviors. He helped teach us about feelings. But as we said a while ago, you cannot contract for feelings. No one truly knows what you feel in your heart towards God or towards them. The language that we have of translating feelings into the love that is tangible is behaviors. It's feeding the hungry, it's clothing the naked, it's being with the aged, it's taking care of those in prisons. It's all those things that God clearly told us in the Sermon on the Mount needed to be done. So that last piece of witness then is to do. So that when you look back a year from now, all of us, me too, I can clearly see the areas where I contributed to the greater good and the greater glory of God. A delayed New Year's resolution then. Understanding that there's a lot that needs to be done. But together, with God's support, we really can't do anything. Let's close in prayer then. God, we know you love us. We understand in some ways that that gives us the worth that we crave to be worth something to God, to be made in God's image, to be given choice unlike anything else out there is given choice. We want to prove we're worth it, but it's hard because the world really is a mess. There are so many things that need to be done, God, that it's so much easier just to expect you to make it work, to get us back to normal, to find that by praying really hard that things just are okay that they are. But we understand your call your moral model through Christ that we must do. So, help us find the clarity to see what we must do. Help us find the clarity to see where our energy is really worth spending. Help us find the resolve if we see where it's worth spending, but we don't want to do it because those people really creep us out to still be the hands and feet you need and help us look back when the task is completed and the next one is started to see the tangibility of the proofs of love gift that we have given to our brothers and sisters and to you. We know that you do not judge us on that, but you are worth it to us. Help us give a little bit of worth to you. Give us the tasks that are tough but not too tough. Give us the strength and support that when they feel too tough, we have perspective to know you've got it. And give us the blessing of coming together with brothers and sisters and understanding that through you and with them, all things are possible. Give us perspective to be what you see us as. And then, with that gift, may you sit back and say it is good. Thank you for loving us. 
Thank you for giving us capacity to love others. Resolve us to do so in this new year. Amen. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let me be my servant too. We are pilgrims on the journey. We are travelers on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. 